About two years ago, I was driving home from a family reunion pretty late at night. The drive was about two hours long. I didn't stay the night because I had to be back to work the following day. Most of the drive was roads with dense bushes and trees on either side. You know, the real creepy ones that you see in movies. So anyway, I've been driving about 45 minutes when I start to get really tired. You know how sometimes you suddenly become really tired out of nowhere? Well, yeah, that happened to me. I knew I wasn't going to last, but I didn't come across any place that I felt I could park and safely sleep. Anyway, after it became clear to me that I wasn't going to find a place to pull up, my tiredness wasn't going to go away. I did something very questionable. I pulled over to the side of the road onto the grass, just behind some bushes, just to try to hide my car, just in case anybody would come past. The roads weren't empty. There was cars passing every few minutes or so. So I made a mental note to myself that the time was 11.22, then fell immediately to sleep. Sometime later, I was awoken by a scratching sound. I looked up at the clock. 11.50. The sound stopped after a few seconds. Because I was still extremely tired, I didn't really bother looking around and simply just went back to sleep. A little later, I was awoken by that same sound. It was now 12.40. This time... It really freaked me out because the sound did not stop. The thought ran across my mind that maybe it was just an animal inspecting the car, but why would it return almost an hour later after it left the previous time? I looked into my rearview mirror, and I just so happened to catch a glimpse of something running back into the forest. Now at the time, I thought it was the hook killer himself. You know the one that scratched the couple's car and then slaughters the guy who went out to go investigate? Yeah, f that, I thought to myself. So I just got the hell out of there. There was a bend no more than 100 yards up the road. As I came around it, there was another car parked off to the side of the road with the driver's side door opened. I slowed down just to look inside to see if anyone was there. There wasn't. When I looked into my rearview mirror again, I didn't see anything. But then all of a sudden, this guy comes sprinting around the corner. He starts screaming at me, shouting stuff like, Hey! Hey you! Get out of your car! Now! I noped the f out of there and sped off, and I never saw that man again. This happened in the summer of 2010, I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take this trip. I remember a lot of my family friends coming with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents. It's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. Always have been. I'm pretty skinny. I'm a fragile kid. So I get spooked very easily, even still now. This, however, was most definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally would. Looking back now, I'm incredibly lucky that I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found kind of strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get into it from the stairs. This information would have been nice before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and the cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of their room and looked around. I was always afraid I'd fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death. They were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety. The first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time even though I still don't fully understand why we were there. On the third day, though, things got strange fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, I heard someone say to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious or maybe she'd passed out or something. 
I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all watching the event in front of them. I decided to rush down to meet them and find out what exactly had happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take maybe 4 flights down, not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find the door to the lobby, only I took 2 more flights of steps before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the 4th floor, nor had there been a door for the 3rd or 2nd. Now at this point I probably should have turned back around. But I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were these weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring. Though I was curious to explore them, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated, but I assumed this was just another way back to the lobby. So I opened them up and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see much. The stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap, tables lined the wall, and in the distance, I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel itself. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back of that room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. The room itself was super muggy and dusty. It seemed like nobody had been down there in quite a long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby and the other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. Must be for employees only. I thought. I turned back towards the stairwell doors, making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. And this is when things started to hit me. I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I did not have a phone either. My parents wouldn't allow me to have one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone for help. My friends and family likely assumed I was still asleep in the room, so I began to freak out, believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse, looking for other ways to get out. Some areas of the place were better lit than the others, so I looked around in areas I could see first, before starting on the darker side of the room. I was on the other side of the doors that I found, but they happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear, it felt like hours, but I only think it was a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather. It was the second door that I'd found. A slim middle-aged man in a lab coat came out from the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat inside a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes. He immediately looked surprised to see me, as one would expect. What are you doing down here? He yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby and been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of here. He didn't answer my key question, and instead he said, uh, I know my way out of here. Just follow me. He began to walk towards the door of the stairwell and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking. Isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, now I was nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and were now headed toward a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and he began walking toward boxes. 
a dead end. I immediately froze, realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said as my voice was shaking, Oh, okay, where are we going? He turned around and just said, This way, follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I had checked there first when I found out the stairwell door was locked. I want to thank whatever god is up there for gifting me with the idea I had next. I started yelling as loud as I possibly could. I yelled so loud that I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet! I continued to yell. I don't even remember how long I was yelling for. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking toward me. I went into a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God that they magically now be open. He didn't run after me, he just walked sternly behind me, muttering things like, stupid fucker, and other kind of things. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through, my savior, a hotel janitor who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation, me and some random guy in a lab coat locked in the basement. He immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who that man was and I told him I had no idea that he'd come in through that door on the other side of the room and I pointed to that one door. The janitor quickly radioed that there was a kid locked in the basement. And quietly, so that I couldn't hear, he said, This man came from outside. Get security. Something like that. The man in the lab coat started to argue with the janitor, claiming that he was just simply looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying what he was selling. And he kept saying things like, Alright buddy, yeah, yeah. Wait till security gets here and talk to them about it. Standing beside him the whole time, trying to take in what was happening. Confused, out of my mind. Eventually an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby. Where I met with my family, who, surprisingly, had no idea that I was even missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking. They hugged me tightly, thanking that janitor over and over for his help. I never got to thank him, though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing inside that basement. I don't really have any information as to what happened afterwards or who he was. I also know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar. I've thought about that day a lot, and the only explanation I could come up with is that door I'd found in the basement that led to the streets of the city or something, where he must have wandered in. I have no clue what his intentions were, or what was up with the lab coat, why he chose to pretend to know a way out. It could very easily be just some kind of huge misunderstanding of some sorts. I just chose a really bad time to get lost in a basement. But, all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not be telling you this story the same way, or even at all. So, strange man in a lab coat wandering in a dark, dusty hotel basement? Let's never meet. I'm a 30-year-old female, and I live in a relatively safe neighborhood, barring the occasional mugging attempts, one of which took place right outside my bedroom window with one of my neighbors, or the few times a random guy in his car follows me to my place, asking me for my number. Things around here are generally stable. I typically have a way of dealing with those assholes, by taking advantage of a random empty lot on my street where cars can't drive, forcing them to go around the block, and by the time they manage to turn around the corner, I ran back into my house, no biggie. A few months ago, some genius in our street paid someone in the city to move the neighborhood garbage disposal to another place, whereas before it was right down the block, now it's a few minutes away. Now I have to walk a while before I can throw my garbage in quite a busy area actually too, which I find embarrassing. So I started waiting until nightfall to do so. I know, stupid, with everything I've told you about before, but I got sloppy. Things started feeling safer in the last few months, so I felt comfortable leaving my home after sundown, at least until last Sunday. Like usual, I waited until it was dark to go. 
After throwing the garbage, I stopped by the convenience store nearby to pick up a few things. On my way back to my place and at the entrance of my street, I noticed a young man standing in front of the parking lot located in front of one of my neighbor's houses, just across the street from mine. He was talking on the phone and looking away from me, but as I rounded up the corner, I noticed another guy sitting quietly on his motorbike right in front of my doorstep. Something about the way he was already looking at me just as my eyes landed on him freaked me out. I did a quick math and realized by the time I would be able to open up my door, if ever, he would catch me if he wanted to. This time, the empty lot trick wouldn't work, as I would have to walk past him, and also, his motorbike could be driven on it. I turned on my heels, back to the convenience store, hoping he was just some kind of delivery guy waiting to meet someone. I dilly-dallied at the store for a while, but when I went back home, I found that he was still there on his bike, while the guy in front of my neighbor's parking lot was also still there on his phone, just staring at me before I'd even seen him. I realized then and there that something was not right, and luckily I did notice the security guard that was on the street sitting at his booth like he normally did. I approached him and explained the whole situation, hoping he'd walk with me to my place, which he gladly did. The moment the guy on the phone saw me return with the security guard, he put his phone in his pocket and turned towards the guy on the bike, who drove up to him. Keep in mind, these two were not even looking at one another, let alone it looked like they even knew each other. The guy who was on his phone sat behind the guy on the motorbike, and they both drove past me while staring at me. Both the security guard and I agreed that something was funny about that entire situation. He thankfully waited until I was safely behind locked doors. I don't know what those two wanted to do, mug me or what, or maybe they had even more sinister intentions. I'm just glad I trusted my gut and didn't go immediately home. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened. The story that I'm about to share occurred over the course of several years, and it only recently ended. It affected almost all of the most important people in my life, affecting us even today, and likely for the rest of our lives. I wanted to share it so everyone can understand just how out of control a seemingly harmless situation can become. Due to the length of the event, I'll likely break this story up into several parts. But first, let me lay it out for you. My brother has always been my closest friend. He is easily the most loving and genuine person I've ever met and is loved by pretty much everyone he meets. Despite this, he hasn't been in many relationships. I think it's partly due to the fact that he's very all or nothing type of guy. When he falls, he falls deeply and blindly. Blessing and a curse, I guess. Anyway, the few girlfriends that he's had, I've known quite well, despite being nearly eight years younger than him. Most of them have been nice, normal, and pleasant girls, with the exception of a few. We've had high hopes, thinking that he'd settle in with a long-term, wonderful girl as he'd entered his adult life. But we had no idea that we'd spend six years sharing a hell with him, our family and our closest friends, all by the hands of one girl. For anonymity's sake, I'll call her Pam. When I met Pam, I was 11, my brother 19, and she was 17, graduating high school. I remember being surprised to have him introduce her right off the bat as his girlfriend, since neither my parents and I had heard anything about her, but she was kind, warm, and an honor student and beautiful. I admired her immediately. For the first year of their relationship, Pam never seemed off. She was always happy, always kind, and always had good stories to tell. She and I grew closer, seemed eager to bond with me, it was like having an older sister. We shared many of the same interests and friendship came easy between she and I, as I was mature for my age and she was so inviting. But halfway through their second year of dating, I began to notice things about Pam, just small odd habits that she had. If someone was having a conversation with my brother that did not directly involve her or that she wasn't a part of, she tended to insert herself as best she could, sitting closer to my brother, laughing a little louder, calling him away, etc. If any of our family or friends would ask my brother questions about college or future aspirations, she'd grow increasingly uncomfortable and sometimes made comments like, 
I hope you have it all planned out, because I'm going wherever you're going. My family and I would chuckle about these behaviors, assuming that Pam just loved my brother and was a bit protective. We liked her a lot and had high hopes for the relationship. I hate to think now how blind we really were. One night my brother came home late from a party. I was 13 at the time, and he was about to turn 21. He walked into the door. Our parents were already asleep, but I was up in the living room. I could immediately tell that he was upset about something, and I asked him what was wrong. As he walked into the kitchen, I realized he had a large welt on his cheek, and I asked, What happened to you? He said, I got into a fight. It's cool. This immediately raised suspicion as my brother was far from the fighting type. A fight over what? I asked. Pam, he said simply, and went into his room. The next morning he was driving me to my soccer game, and I pried again, asking about what had happened. He didn't answer at first, but then said, Pam is kind of weird. I asked him how so, and he said, I don't know, man. She just likes to start things. Pam was a pathological liar. Apparently, she did it all the time. Looking back, the constant new stories of places she'd been and things she'd done didn't seem to be all too truthful. That night at the party, Pam had told my brother that another guy at the party had attempted to rape her. My brother, being the man he is, confronted him and he said, I've never even seen that girl before. A fight ensued over the accusation. On the ride home, Pam said that my brother must have misinterpreted her words and that nothing close to rape had occurred. The lying seemed to be a detrimental bump in the road. My brother broke things off. After several weeks, Pam contacted me, asking if I wanted to go shopping with her. Having a good relationship in the past with her, I agreed. My parents thought it was strange that a 20-year-old wanted to spend time with her ex-boyfriend's 14-year-old sister. They'd let me go anyway. The day started pleasantly. Pam caught me up on her life and asked how I was doing, how the family was doing, how my brother was doing. Nothing seemed strange until she began to bring up uncomfortable conversations. She explained to me that she had a sexually traumatic childhood. That's why she lied so much. But she also aggressively defended herself saying, whatever your brother told you, it's a lie. He's the one telling lies. That's why I had to break up with him. She seemed to jerk around the conversation from normal to deeply personal and then strange. She explained in detail to me a lesbian experience that she had after ending her relationship with my brother and then told me I should try it when I became of age, of course. I became increasingly uncomfortable with that conversation. She noticed and immediately apologized, saying that she really liked being my friend and that she loved my brother. That's why she was acting so crazy. I told her I liked being her friend too, that I understood her feelings. This was a mistake. This is when the phone calls began. It started with just one. She called me a week after we hung out at 10 p.m. She was sobbing and saying that she was so sad without my brother, that she needed to get him back. Then, they happened nightly, later and later each time. I'd be dead asleep at 2 a.m. and receive a sobbing, hysterical, and desperate phone call. I felt so much pity for her in those moments that I continued to answer. One call would be different than the other though. She wasn't hysterical now. She wasn't crying. I picked up the phone at 1.30 in the morning and heard a level voice. Monotone Pam. She said in one sentence, Tell your brother I'm going to slit my f***ing throat tonight. And then hung up. I felt numb. I've never experienced that before. No one I knew ever behaved that way. I texted her over and over and over again, asking if she was okay, telling her not to do anything. I panicked. I thought I'd done something wrong and that since she told me, I would be responsible in some way. The next day, I told my brother what happened. He said he'd go to her house and check on her. A week later, Pam arrives at my house, arm in arm with my brother. They'd gone back together, it seemed, as if nothing had even happened. She smiled at me never once mentioned any of the phone calls that she'd made to me. The next month is when things really escalated. Came home from school to my entire family sitting in the living room. He told me to sit down, and I thought someone in our life had died. My mother told me, your brother let us know how you're feeling. I had no idea what they were talking about. Feeling? I asked. 
My brother looked at me with pity in his eyes. Ham told me that she wasn't the one who called you. You called her. And you're the one who isn't feeling well. What the f- No, that's not what happened. She called me every single night for two weeks crying, saying she wanted you back. No, that's not what she said. She said that you called her with your problems and that she wasn't sure what to do. I was so angry. Her lies were continuing, and now my family was believing them, and enough to stage this whole intervention. I showed them the text messages that she'd sent me, played them the voice messages, showed my call history, and that immediately put an end to that lie. After that, I wanted nothing to do with her. My brother broke up with her again. She called him hundreds of times, sent hundreds of messages. She showed up at our house a few times with baked goods, trying to apologize, but we ignored her. Eventually, she left us alone, and we didn't hear from her for almost a year. On my last day of class before winter break during my sophomore year, I walked out of school and was met by an incredibly unwelcome surprise. This is where things got scary. Pam was pacing in front of the school, biting her nails and scratching her head. Her face looked sunken in. She had bags underneath her eyes. I almost didn't even recognize her. I began to cut across the front lawn with my friend Liz just to avoid her. She saw me walked as fast as she could in my direction. She reached out her arms for a hug, but I stopped. The first thing that she said to me was, You're mad at me? I asked her what she was doing here. She laughed quietly. I wanted to apologize for whatever your brother told you. I'm sick, Oz. She used a nickname only my brother called me. I know. Please do not talk to me anymore. I started to walk away, knowing my brother was parked waiting for me around the corner. Pam reached out, grabbed my shoulder as I did. I quickly pulled away and said, I'm serious, leave us alone. I think you need some help, Pam. She immediately started to cry, but I turned away and just left. My brother pulled into the front parking lot of the school and opened up his door for me. Is that fucking Pam? He just looked through his front mirror. Yeah, I don't know what she's on, but she's crazy, man. That night around 1 a.m., there was a knock at our door. My dad went to it and looked through the peephole. Uh, he said, surprised. I think it's... I think it's Pam. Do not open it. She's on some kind of drug, my brother said. My mom wanted to call the police, but my brother and my dad said we should just wait and see if she goes away. A few moments later... She rapped on the door harder and harder, got more violent as it went on. We heard her wailing and yelling. I hear you. Let me in. Let me in. As she cried, my brother said she's got a baseball bat or something. Coming from his room where he looked out the window, I looked from the den window. It looked like something out of a horror movie. She was wearing this grubby, nasty dress, barefooted. Her hair had been cut to above her shoulders and was in a wild halfway bun, halfway out mess. She had wiped her makeup down her face like a ghoulish movie character. She looked even thinner than she did in daylight. She swung a metal baseball bat as she stumbled around our yard. Calling the police, she must be drunk, my mother said. No, it's fine. She's just given a show. She'll leave. We didn't know people actually behaved like this. It was all eerily entertaining for just a moment, like watching a true crime show. But just as she'd been manically stumbling around, she stopped. She stood still, staring vacantly up toward the upstairs bedrooms, tilting her head to the side, up and down and licking her lips. What is she on, heroin or something? My dad asked. Pam began to shift back and forth between laughing, yelling, and crying. We all sat down as my brother tried to phone her mom's phone, try to get her to leave. We sat there and listened to the frightening, animalistic sounds outside. But then they just stopped, looked out the windows, she was gone. We all sat in silence for just a moment, taking in that whole strange encounter. My father just chuckled and shook his head. My mother shook hers pitying the girl for being so disturbed. 
but I was frightened. No one, except for maybe my brother, had seen how quickly her demeanor and her mental state would just unravel from overprotective nature to small lies to pathological lies to full-blown manic outbreaks. But this was her worst. We didn't expect anything else to come of it, that she'd fade away from our lives since now she knew we weren't giving in to her desperation. But in the next two years, we learned how wrong we really were. This is part two of an ordeal that I've experienced at the hands of an emotionally unstable person. In the first part of my experience, I discussed the beginning of my family and my own relationship with my brother's girlfriend at the time, Pam. I explained the small warning signs of insecurity and reoccurring lies progressed into much more manic, violent, and aggressive outbursts. Part 2 covers the first four years out of a six-year ordeal. I was age 11 to 15 during the occurrences told in Part 1. Part 2 begins at the beginning of my junior year of high school. After the wintertime incident at our house, Pam stopped coming around. She was still very present, however. Every member of my family endured daily text messages and phone calls. They ranged from apologetic and stable to incredibly distraught or outraged. She would curse and sometimes make threats. I remember wanting to sleep with the lights on for several months after that incident, afraid that she'd climb into the fence of our backyard. And I'd find her standing at my window with that same vacant, crazed look she had in our front yard. All four of us eventually decided that we have to have our phone numbers changed and block her from our devices and all social media accounts. She still had our home phone number. Pam left some of the most frightening and haunting messages I've ever heard. I can remember standing in the kitchen with my family, my brother playing the messages back for us, and one stood out. It showed us how unstable and potentially dangerous that she truly was. Parents had returned from an early morning indoor soccer game in February of 2015. My brother asked us to come into the kitchen because we had to hear the new kind of crazy that Pam had become. The first message was about 30 seconds long. It was received at 12.30 a.m. the night before. Pam sounded mildly angry and demanded that we return the batch of cookies that she brought us to a 4th of July party some years ago because she didn't want us to have them anymore. We all exchanged humor glances about how ridiculous of a request that really was. My mother turned to leave, amused, but my brother stopped her, saying that that wasn't the crazy part. My brother played another message, received at roughly 3 in the morning that same day. We were confused at first because the first 15 seconds was just white noise, the kind you would hear when a device plays the sound recording of an empty room, if you know what I'm talking about. Then all of a sudden, in a deep, animalistic and enraged voice, she screamed. Stop fucking playing with me. You're gonna get it. And then abruptly ended the call. We were all startled by this. I want to call the police. They need to know that this girl isn't all there. And who knows what she's capable of. My dad decided that if anything physically happened again, we'd be filing a report with the police and that they weren't just phone calls. My brother assured us that she was all talk and wouldn't come around again. At this point, I agreed with my mother. I no longer felt safe. I had never been around someone who behaved like this, I was constantly anxious, and had no idea what I'd do if she came around again. I felt like I was stuck in a Lifetime movie, because I didn't think that things like this really happened. That someone I knew so personally could be hiding such a deeply withheld, violent, and manic side. It had always been there, but we set it in motion. After disconnecting the landline, the personal phone call stopped, and we didn't hear from her ourselves, but some of my friends my brother shared with Pam would come to him, saying that Pam wanted to speak with him, and that she would call and message them regularly, wanting his phone number. Luckily, none of them gave it to her. Just before that same summer, Pam disappeared. No one got any messages, no one saw her in town. Nothing. Nothing until my brother received an email from Pam's mother. My brother continued to speak to occasionally. She informed my brother that Pam's family had moved her to the East Coast to undergo treatment for a drug habit. Pam's mother had given us more information about the mental state of her daughter. Her mother had not spoken to or seen Pam much during the time she unraveled. When she came to our house or when she made those phone calls, 
Pam's mother had been under the impression my brother was still in a healthy relationship with her and only learned about their breakup and the incidents following it. She explained that her daughter had always been like a white liar, making up stories that didn't make sense, blaming others for things that she'd already been caught for, arguing the truth of things that were already proven facts. I don't think she ever thought that anything she did was wrong. Even when it was, I don't understand it, because she's not raised that way, her mother had explained to my brother. Pam's issues were something that had always been present, settled comfortably beneath an intelligent and attractive exterior. She'd fooled us, maybe even herself. Without Pam to worry about, our lives seemed to go back to normal. I still looked over my shoulder every now and again, but I was preparing for 11th grade. My brother was beginning a new career and dating a new girl, the daughter of a close family friend who he'd grown up with. Pam started to fade away from our minds, for a while at least. As myself and my friends began to drive, I remember noticing a car quite a bit. You know that car you see repeatedly around the area you live in. You notice it more and more than others, because you noticed it once and now you can't stop noticing it since you found out it exists. You know it belongs to someone, but you've never seen the driver, just only the car. It was like that. I had noticed it out of the corner of my eye at a stoplight, or out of the window of a restaurant as it drove past. In those moments, I didn't think much of it, but I noticed it pretty much almost every single time that I was out. Walking, driving, many times with my brother. I didn't understand how often I'd see it until one day, it clicked, and it startled me. It scared me. I saw it parked in my neighborhood and I remember thinking, that's that fucking car. What's it doing here? We lived in a smaller, older neighborhood. Most of the people who lived there had been there for a long time. We knew a lot of the neighbors and houses were pretty much never on the market. New people showed up maybe once every five years or so. And when they did, most people knew about it. So an out of place but oddly familiar car came as a huge surprise to me. I pointed it out to my brother, who had been in the car with me at the time, and he said, Oh yeah, I've seen it a few times. I didn't feel right about it, but I assumed maybe I was just being paranoid. A few months later, I was well into school. I had a job and was too busy to let myself worry, even though I constantly did. One day at work, I was wiping down tables in the front of the restaurant, as it was a pretty slow day, only a few people in the store. I remember seeing someone standing outside the front doors, just barely visible out the window. I was busy and just assumed that they were deciding where to have lunch, as another restaurant was directly next to ours, and people did this quite often. They weren't there anymore, and I assumed that they'd just gone next door. I went out to clear the dishes off the front patio and clean it up, and I saw them walking away from the store, down the strip of businesses inside the plaza. Back inside as I worked, I noticed again that same person walked back and forth several more times. I was weary at this point as the person seemed to linger for about an hour now, but I didn't really think anything of it. I was a theater student and had to take some time off for a play that I was in. Come opening night, I was so burnt out that I didn't even notice anything, even if it was out of the ordinary. My family came opening night, the fourth show, and closing night. Leaving with my family on the fourth show is when I snap back into my anxiety-ridden reality. That car was in the parking lot. It was parked a few rows away from my parents' car. I had never seen it in my school before, and I knew it didn't belong to any of my classmates. What does Pam drive? I asked my brother. Pam? <laughs> I don't know why. That stupid car. It freaks me out. It's like everywhere we are. A few days later, I had an answer. At closing night of my show, I went out into the lobby of the theater to greet everyone when they finished. I hugged my parents and my brother, but I noticed they were all looking very distraught. My brother was visibly upset and my parents were trying to make conversation, the way they do when they're trying to avoid something. What happened? I asked. Uh, Pam. She was here. I sort of felt the color run out of my face. I didn't know how much Pam had done that frightened me until then. 
Did she leave? I don't know, my brother said. Don't worry about it. I went and got my things. I remember how strangely violated I felt. Pam had been watching me for the past two hours without me knowing that she was even in the same state, let alone the same building. I decided to go home straight away. We left the building, and there she was. She was looking at her phone, standing at the mouth of one of the hallways in front of the theater. I stopped for a brief moment. The four of us decided to walk as hurried as we could towards the parking lot, hoping to just ignore her, breeze past her. She looked different, still skinny, but she was wearing makeup again. From a distance, she almost looked like the old Pam, but as we got closer, she looked up from her phone and still had that vacant animal quality to her face. A bit of anger flashed her face as she noticed us. She looked like she was going to say something. We all pretended not to notice her and just continued on. She followed closely behind us. Hey, wait a minute. At the front of the school, my brother stopped as we kept walking, and I heard him say, You need to stop. We got into our car and watched them talk from a distance. I wanted to get into our car and just leave. My mom and I got in while my dad stood outside. Pam was yelling at my brother at this point. He made his way back to his car. Pam smiled artificially and waved towards my brother, shouting a goodbye to him as he went before storming off to her car. My brother stopped to talk to my dad for a moment, got into his own car, and left after Pam peeled out of the lot. It was the same car that I'd been seeing for the past month and a half. Well, just as crazy as ever, my dad said as he started the car. We may need to call the police. We lived just a short distance from the school, but I was shaken up. I wanted my dad to drive as fast as possible. Every headlight we saw chilled me. I stared at my phone trying not to look out the window. I nearly dropped it. We reached a street in our neighborhood. The stop sign to the right of us was her car. Dad, that's her. He drove straight, and she turned the same direction. Dad, she's following us. I had never felt quite so panicked. Call the police, please, my dad said to my mother. His voice as level as ever. I stared out the back window, ducking low into my seat. My dad turned down another street, and she continued to follow. I'm going to go in a circle to see if she follows us, okay? My dad said. I was crying at this point as I came to a realization. For four more turns, my mom spoke to a 911 operator, unable to accurately name streets as they were not lit and it was pitch black outside. I laid across the back seat listening to my parents yell at each other, frustrated and I'm sure frightened. My dad cursed as she continued to follow us more closely. The car was flooded with light as she would turn on her brights. The grill of her car almost touching our bumper. My dad turned to mirror away to keep the light out of his eyes and sped up the car. Eventually the light was gone and I could no longer hear the drone of her engine behind us. She was gone. We got home 10 minutes later and turned on every light in our house. My dad checked every closet in our back and side yards, carrying his gun with him. For the past month, Pam had been stalking both my brother and I. Seeing that car had not been a coincidence. She knew what we both were doing. She came to my school functions on both nights my family was there, maybe even all three nights. She knew where I was. She'd followed me all over town. She'd been around our neighborhood and was now lurking around my new workplace. All of a sudden, those threats became real. Pam was no longer afraid of crossing boundaries, if she even ever had been. We were now in the middle of a full-blown nightmare. My family was no longer safe. She'd gone away to cure one disease, but returned, having fed and grown another. She was now our personal terrorist, with the power to single-handedly pull our everyday lives apart. She had already begun to do just that, too. What may seem like the bad plot of a horror movie, the psychotic ex-girlfriend wreaking havoc, was our reality times ten. I cannot express to you how terrible it is to be kept awake by something you cannot see, but you know exists and is waiting for you when you get out of bed. 
I never expected a human being could terrify me more than any horrible monster or even the boogeyman. Those things don't even exist. I'm sharing this whole ordeal to help others understand warning signs and to pressure those who see them to take action to protect themselves. Despite the terror of that night, this was only halfway year five of six and the things would continue to approach a boiling point. I will upload part three of Pam sometime in the next day or two. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my story. Now that I've written it, I see just how severe it really was. This will be my final posting of Pam's story. It will follow the final year and a half of my six year struggle with a mentally unstable individual. My family, though strong, is still recovering today. After we told my brother about what Pam had done the night before my show, he finally began to confide in me the details of his relationship with her. She had come to his high school as a sophomore during his senior year. She immediately caught the attention of my brother and his friends, as she was beautiful and expected to be reserved as a new student. However, my brother recalled his female friends saying that she was really aggressive and trying to make friends and liked to talk about how her family had moved here from an affluent community in Texas. It was so elite that it didn't have a name. Many of his friends also got strange vibes from her and pinned her as a weird snobby girl almost immediately. My brother met her again a few years later when she came into where he was working at the time and how he said that she'd seemed to mature vastly. He took her on only one date and almost immediately she wanted to officiate their relationship. He thought it was a bit forward, but didn't hesitate because she seemed impressed with her elegant way of speaking, kind words, and pretty face. However, he noticed red flags only a few weeks into their relationship. Pam was very insecure, constantly asking my brother if he still had feelings for her, if he was angry with her, and if he thought she was attractive enough. Eventually, this insecurity took a different shape. Pam would send my brother unsolicited nude pictures of herself in the middle of the day, attached to messages asking if he still liked the way her body looked. If my brother went a period of time in their conversations without calling her beautiful or telling her how nice she looked, Pam would point this out. If he protested in any way, she'd become emotional and claim he didn't love her anymore. This behavior mellowed until the end of the second year of their relationship. This is when the narcissism became apparent. Pam would often talk lowly of my brother's previous girlfriends and female friends, boasting about how much more attractive she was than them. Pam refused to attend several of the events my brother asked her to go to, like my birthday or our aunt's funeral, because she wouldn't know anyone and would have no one to talk to. She also enjoyed referring to herself as a princess and wanted to constantly be doted upon. She often argued with my brother about him spending time with his friends because she didn't understand why he would want to be around anyone but her. She was 100% convinced that she would one day be a celebrity and marrying my brother. Anytime my brother hinted at wanting to end the relationship, Ham would fly off the handle, becoming belligerent and promising to kill herself. My brother was trapped by the fear of her harming herself. He'd often think that she was simply bluffing or wouldn't actually do anything, but one day, he discovered several bottles of prescription pills in her home. He asked her about them, and she told him that they were antidepressants prescribed to her after the death of her brother. A brother who we later found out never existed. Eventually, Pam became so angry when my brother would want to spend time with his friends or family without her. He also told me that Pam fixated a lot of anger on me, and once she proceeded to refer to me as a slut made comments and theories about how my mother must have had an affair, which I was the product of, because I was so ugly and my brother was not. So my brother decided it was time, it was time to end it no matter what. This information deeply troubled me, as all of her actions following that, like asking me to spend time with her, wanting to be my friend, showing up at school and all those phone calls, were definitely ill-intended, and even more psychotic now that they've been at the time. But for the final year and a half of our deal with Pam, Psychotic could not even begin to explain what she did to us. I slept little in the weeks following that car incident. My brother who lived across town visited and called more frequently. 
I suspected he felt just as uneasy as I did. The nights I did sleep, I would often sweat through nightmares of girls with axes or gowned women standing at the foot of my bed or at my window. One night in early December of 2015, it was a rainy and particularly windy night. I wanted to let the cold air in and thought the sound of the rain would help me sleep. So I cracked the window only enough to see where it could reach the second latch. I also placed the piece of wood my father had cut to help with security behind the window. I pulled my curtains in front of the window, leaving the cracked part of the window uncovered to allow the air to pass through the heavy blackout curtain. I remember waking from sleep, vaguely hearing a foreign noise against the roof of my window. My room was on the second floor of our house. Our house had three levels, and the second story was only six or seven steps up from the primary floor of our house. All of the spaces were different levels, but the bedrooms were the highest and slightly lower than they'd be in a classic two-story home. What I'm getting at is that my room was hard to get to from the outside, but not if you were aware of the parts of our home and the access points from other roof levels over the living room and the garage. I shook the noise off. It was storming. I thought maybe some leaves or branches were moving it around. I turned over to face the wall opposite my window. Not even a second later, my room was illuminated by a surge of white light. I shot up in bed. I was momentarily paralyzed with horror. Every one of my limbs felt as if they were floating. I was trying to make sense of what had just happened. Then, again, myself and every item in my room became a black silhouette. As another flash filled the space, I threw the blankets off me and ran as fast as I could down the hallway. I was screaming so loud I surprised even myself. I ran into my dad as he threw open his bedroom door. He was panicked and held me by my shoulders in the doorway of their bedroom and yelled at me to tell him what was wrong. Someone is taking pictures of me through my window. The roof and house was checked and they of course found nothing and no one. My mother sat up with me, asking every basic question a parent would ask. Are you dreaming? Are you sure it wasn't lightning? There was no thunder, and I was sure that there had not been at the time that it happened. The flashes did not have that same hue as lightning did. I had taken enough cell phone pictures in my life to identify the flash of a camera. I don't know if they believed me then, but I would eventually have proof that would astonish them. My brother adopted Ike in January of 2016. Ike was a two-month-old Chesapeake Bay Retriever with one gold eye and one green eye. He had a very distinct white mark on his chest that looked like an hourglass and a white sock on his front left paw. Ike was the love of my brother's life, aside from his now fiance Kara. Ike would end the torture just three months later. The holidays and my brother's engagement to Kara who was amazing, beautiful, and whose family we had known our whole lives, I had lifted my family's spirits immensely. My brother was starting his family almost done with the police academy and seemed untouchable by any memory of Pam. We felt optimistic for the first time in quite a long time. Pam hadn't been around, at least to our knowing, in several weeks. Everything was normal. Things were looking up. But again, that didn't last. A month or so after bringing him home, after letting him into the backyard for a few minutes by himself, Kara told us that Ike had escaped from the yard. She panicked and ran around the neighborhood looking for him. She got into her car and called me upset and drove around the block looking for him. She picked me up and I helped her look in the creek area behind where my brother's house was. We couldn't find him. However, when we arrived back at my brother's house, Ike was sitting on the front porch. We were relieved. She was unharmed and it seemed as happy as ever, despite missing his collar. I helped Kara check the yard for ways he could have gotten out, and we both decided he must have shimmied through a small gap in the gate on the side yard. I couldn't help but being confused as to no grass or burrs was in his fur, but we thought nothing of it. A few weeks later, both my brother and Kara were going on a weekend trip with some friends, and I offered to take care of Ike. They dropped him off on the Friday before the three-day weekend. Ike was happy and played with our older lab Des. On the second night he was with us, I was out with some friends, and my dad had let both dogs into the yard around 8 p.m. He sat in his chair in the living room watching a show with my mom. 
They say that they remember hearing Des barking because he yelled for him to be quiet, but they assume the puppy was just riling him up. A few minutes later, Des came to the door to be led inside. He ran in and barked at my dad. My dad was confused as our dog was not a regular barker. He called for Ike, but he didn't come. My dad went out and looked around in the bushes and still did not find him. He became concerned and hurried into the house to get a light. He checked the swimming pool, didn't see him. My mother joined in quickly and they both scoured the large yard, but could not find him. When I got home, they had just finished searching the front and side yards. I told him that he had escaped once before, so we decided to get into the car and go look for him. As we drove around yelling for him, attracting the help of a few neighbors, I thought about how strange it was that a well-behaved puppy had suddenly become a master escape artist in the past three weeks or so. Our yard had seen three or so dogs grow up in it, some younger and smaller than Ike. We've never had that problem. The fences were high and well-built. My dad had replaced the one on the side of the house just a few summers ago. We did not find him. I hoped that he'd return that night, like he did that last time, but he didn't. I informed my brother on Sunday, I proceeded to look around all day in surrounding areas, the ponds, shelters, vet clinics, even looking on the side of the road. We found nothing. My brother was completely heartbroken. I helped him make flyers to post around in our neighborhood and his. A couple of weeks passed and we heard nothing. My dad was doing yard work in mid-February. He came in after a few hours and he set something on the kitchen table. What's that? I knit my brow as I saw it. It's Ike's collar. It was in the front yard. I almost hit it with the mower. You'll have to take it to your brother. It was Ike's collar. His first collar. Not the one he'd been wearing the night when he went missing from our yard. It was his puppy collar. The one he'd lost the day he got out of the yard at my brother's house. I called Kara and asked if they found it. And she said they hadn't and had bought him a new one. That's when it clicked. Someone had stolen my brother's dog not once, but twice. I told my brother, Kara, and my parents my theory. It was not difficult for one of them to understand. It had to be connected to everything else, right when we thought she was out of our lives. We decided to take it to the police to add to our case file on Pam. I also told them about the night I'd been photographed from my window. The police, like many times before, told us they couldn't do anything. There's no proof she'd done any of this. Frustrated, defeated, and frightened once again. A few short weeks later in April of 2016, new developments would finally end it all. By complete godsend coincidence, Kara was with her mother in a small town 45 minutes away from ours. We were planning for my 17th birthday that month, and so preoccupied, we almost put Pam and the fact that she undoubtedly had been watching us for months and had no doubt stolen, maybe even killed, my brother's puppy and thrown his collar in our front yard to help us connect the dots and give her credit. However, while Kara window shop in the center of town, she and her mother noticed a car parked on the street. A car with a puppy in it. It was a bit warm out, so they walked to the window and peeked in at the animal. Kara immediately recognized him by his eyes and the marking on his chest and the obvious fact that he began crying as soon as she called his name and he saw her. She phoned the police, phoned my brother, and sat back on the trunk of the car. The police arrived and the owner of the car came to it. The girl was immediately upset by the presence of the police and Kara's angry accusations. The girl was not Pam, and she became rather helpful. The girl said that she'd purchased the dog only a few days ago from an ad online. She told the police that the girl she purchased her from was super shady and all too eager to get rid of the dog, who was now super skinny and sold at a very cheap price. The girl who had sold the dog to her claimed that she didn't want the stupid dog. It was a present from her boyfriend, but it was the wrong kind. Pam had always liked small dogs. She told the police that she'd met the girl to purchase the dog at an apartment complex a few minutes from where they were but that she wasn't sure which apartment the girl actually lived in. The police, after Kara had informed them of the situation, 
used Pam's name to find out she did indeed live in the apartment complex with two roommates. They interviewed Pam's roommates the next day, but Pam was not there. They told detectives that they almost never saw Pam. Her room was always locked and she was almost always gone. She didn't have a job, though she claimed to have one, and her mother was there a lot, checking up on her and dropping off rent to them. However, when they did speak to her, she talked a lot about her past relationship, switching between how much she loved him and his family to how they all deserved to die and were going to hell. With the information given by the girl who had purchased Ike and by Pam's roommates, the police finally had sufficient evidence to search Pam's apartment. I don't know much about what they found, but what I do know horrified my family and horrified me. On Pam's computer, they found hundreds upon hundreds of pictures of my brother, my parents, Kara, and of me. Our cars, our houses, my school, my brother's school, Ike, pictures taken through our windows at night, pictures of us sleeping, photos taken from our social media of vacations, the picture of my brother's proposal to Kara. She'd even doctored herself into some of them. She still had the pictures of her and my brother with her and my family up and around in her room. She had kept Ike in her closet for weeks on a towel, just water and little food. In her search history, they found everything from fantasy to other violent pornography, and even weapon research. The police now had sufficient evidence to arrest her. Pam had been obsessively stalking my family for more than two years. She'd stalked us from her car, following us around town. It had been her, snapping photos of me from the roof outside my window. She had watched my brother drop Ike off at our house. She had documented her opinions of us, our habits, and her plans in a journal, which we will not get to see until the case is taken to trial next. My brother, myself, and my father, the girl we found Ike with, Pam's roommates, several of my brother's friends, and Pam's mother, will all testify against her. It will be the first face-to-face -face interaction any of us have had with her in many, many months, and I'm terrified. But I'm also angry. I'm angry that evil, narcissistic, malevolent, psychotic parasites like her had latched onto my brother and onto my family and single-handedly stripped us of our security, our sanity, and our trust. Every creak, every bump, every unknown face, and every vehicle following too closely will send me into a tailspin of dread, and I'll see her again, standing in my front yard in her dress, and looking up to the sky with a vacant, animalistic gaze. My life became a real horror story, not because of a haunted house or because of an axe-wielding murderer, but because of a sick girl with a broken mind and a fixation on something unattainable. I'm 17 years old and I've experienced an ordeal most will read and think is just a sad attempt at a thrilling fiction post. My family is healing, I'm healing, and she did not break us. I hope that this story helps anyone who's gone through something similar to feel not so alone. I hope that those of you who read this and think of someone who shows the same warning signs as Pam did are now prepared to take action to protect yourselves. Do not wait until things get as bad as they got for me. Be aware of the power of mental instability and the danger behind it. As our trial happens, we will learn more. I may update posting this with more information. I can't thank you all enough for the support you've given me as I've posted my ordeal. I'm relieved to have written all of it into words I could not find in these past six years of my life. I'm stronger from it. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All of these links are below. What's going on everybody? Um, I hope you really enjoyed this episode. I actually had intentions of making this a stories for sleep and then putting everything from this previous month 
into it to make it a bit a little bit longer but there's going to be like two more episodes or two or three more episodes next week in the last month or the last week of june so i'm just going to wait till next week to do that so that i can make it even longer and just throw all the rest of those stories in there as well um i also have an idea which isn't really my idea but i think i'm going to start recording stories live um and was wondering if you guys would be interested in tuning in for that or uh, would enjoy that type of thing. Pretty much basically like the same thing Joel does with Let's Read. I just want to you know, communicate more, uh, talk to you guys more on a more regular basis that's not just through comments and stuff like that. Um, also, yeah, I hope you, uh, I, I really fine-tuned and found some stories for this one that I actually thought were scary and intense and the last one about the girl named Pam, uh, that one was really, really intense and um, really long. That's probably the longest single story I've ever recorded. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I looked, uh, looked high and low, and I really try to take pride in putting decent stories on my channel. I know there's still plenty of people that bitch about it, either these stories they've heard before or these stories aren't scary enough. But each time I go out of my way to make sure that I comment on those of you who feel the need to comment something constantly negative about whether you've heard the story before or whether it's not scary enough. Hey, I'm looking for somebody to find stories for me and I will pay you money to do so. So maybe then you can be the person who dictates and puts stories into my episode so that you know you can no longer bitch about them not being scary or being duplicates. So, yeah, if that's you or if that sounds like you or if you want to be the person to do that, reach out. I'm still looking for somebody. OK, sound good? All right. I love you all. Uh, I will see you in the next episode, which will more than likely be Tuesday, Wednesday. Not sure what I'm doing yet, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Cheers.